So we have an amazing panel to talk about this this morning. We essentially have two professors and two practitioners. Um, I don't think they need much introduction, but very briefly, on my left, your right, is Ken Rogoff from Harvard University. Next to him is Elizabeth Rossiello, Chief Executive Officer of BPESA in Senegal. Next to him, no, sorry, next to her is Zhu Ning um, from Tsinghua University in China, who's one of our two professors looking at this in terms of financial stability and financial system analysis. And at the end is Jeremy Allaire, who's founder and chief executive officer of Circle USA. So I'd like to start with you, Ken, or Professor Rogoff, um, and ask you, you have spent your life looking at the sweep of financial history and what happens when new products come up, when they die, good ideas, bad ideas, risks. When you look at what's happening with crypto architecture today, how do you see that within the bigger financial history story? Is it really something different? Is it really a case that this time is different, to quote your book? Or is it just same old, same old, another crazy bubble? <clears throat> well, I, I should start by um, qualifying my remarks with saying that uh, in 2012, my daughter, who was just a little over, maybe she was 13 at the time, uh, somehow mined 24 Bitcoin, and she owned them. And she said, Daddy, uh, what should I do? Somebody's offered me a $60 Amazon gift card for them, and I told her to sell. So uh, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can take my remarks. With and that. did she? <laughs> Unfortunately, she did. I'd like to have told her, I said I told her to sell at the end of 2017, but I didn't. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, you know, there's sort of two levels here. The, I want to address, and there are many others the panel will. Uh, one is the currency aspect of the cryptocurrency, and the other is the bubble aspect that you just raised. Uh, I think the possibility of a uh, cryptocurrency taking over for a fiat money, uh, dollar, pounds, whatever, is basically zero. And in the history of currency, the private sector invents everything. Uh, the king of Lydia, when he stamped the first coins at seventh century, uh, uh, seven centuries, uh, before the birth of Christ, um, he hadn't invented it. The private sector had done many of these coins, but he took it over. Uh, paper currency was reinvented many times in China and Europe. The private sector invented it. The public sector basically regulated and abrogated it. And I promise you that's the end game here. I think if you take the crypto out of cryptocurrency, uh, so that you can do anonymous transactions. There's, there's just not value added compared to fiat money. Uh, under, under the current system, yes, if we had Venezuelan inflation everywhere in the world, it would look very attractive. I, I want to, uh, and so eventually it will be regulated much, <laughs> much, much more than it is today. That's really just starting. Uh, whether, to what extent the technology is appropriated, I don't know. We'll hear other discussions. I, I, I hear a lot of thoughts that maybe a centralized uh, system, whether you have a trusted party, might work better, but we could debate that. Um, then, uh, but I want to say, I don't think it's worthless. Uh, so their economists are zero. It's absolute zero. I'm not so sure. The US has sa financial sanctions, heavy financial sanctions, on 12 countries, that include Russia, Iran, North Korea, and many others. They don't necessarily have an incentive to play ball here with everybody else. And so we could see a home there. Or, of course, I assume the world works well. And if we go into some dystopian future, that could be different. On the bubble aspect, yes, it's absolutely classic bubble. It doesn't, again, mean the price was zero. But I mean, I think this is transparently a bubble, and there'll be many papers on it. Right. OK, thank you. Well, I look forward to reading your papers on this financial bubble. Um, although I don't think necessarily I'll be asking you for investment advice <laughs> <laughs> anytime soon. But I'd like to turn to you, Jeremy, because Ken just said there's zero chance of crypto replacing fiat currency. So I, I, First of all, yeah. tell us what you do briefly. You have, yeah. you know, what's your elevator pitch for your company, which is kind of doing what Ken says isn't possible? Sure. So Circle is a global crypto finance company. We operate in about with customers in about 195 countries. Last year, we handled about $80 billion in transactions. Um, and 
uh, we, we provide a payment system built on cryptocurrency. Uh, we provide investment products. We provide capital markets infrastructure for different, crypt, different types of crypto assets, both currencies, commodities, and uh, very soon uh, what we call crypto securities. Um, and then we uh, most recently launched um, uh, U.S. dollar coin, which is a, a cryptocurrency rendition of the U.S. dollar. And that's part of a consortium that we co-founded with Coinbase, another leading crypto company, that will ultimately roll out um, you know, uh, tokenized versions of major fiat currencies. Uh, and that all runs on top of the Ethereum blockchain currently. So I, I that's the sort of high level on, on Circle. Um, and we've been working at this for almost six years. I think um, uh, you know, there's a few key things I, I would say. I think the first is, generally speaking, when people think about cryptocurrency, they have very, very simplistic views of it's Bitcoin. Um, the reality is that this is an incredibly diverse technical landscape. Uh, there are, are an incredibly diverse range of uh, projects with different technical philosophies, economic philosophies. Um, and, and much of it is, is really best thought about as sort of a natural evolution of the basic protocols and infrastructure of the internet. Um, I think uh, you know, we have these open networks. They've enabled us to do some amazing things. We have instant global free access to all the world's knowledge. We can communicate freely, instantly with anyone in the world. And that's built on decentralized protocols that no government controls, no corporation controls. It's all open intellectual property that's open source in nature that people contribute to. There have been some big companies built on top of that that are relatively centralized. That's actually one of the concerns crypto has is how do we decentralize information architectures, not just the financial <coughs> system. Um, but this is a broader architectural evolution. And um, platforms like Ethereum, and there are probably 10 or 15 others that are trying to compete with Ethereum, um, are really trying to build a new, global, open, immutable record-keeping system, transaction processing system, and computing engine that you can run applications on that are really <laughs> useful when you have lots of parties that don't trust each other. And they're not specific just to uh, currency. I think currency is a great use case. That's why we launched US dollar coin. Um, but they really touch almost every single record-keeping industry in the world, from governance of corporations to voting to health records. Uh, to reconstructing the you know, fundamental primitives of the entire global financial system. So we see this as much more transformative even than the web. We think this has an arc, it's a, a long arc, that will have a, you know, a far greater impact on our civic institutions, our economic institutions, <coughs> uh, and, uh, and on the nature of the firm itself over the long run. So we, we take a very different view. You can talk about Bitcoin specifically um, you know, and debate whether or not a non-sovereign uh, you know, uh, you know, confidential, uh, you know, uncensorable form of money is valuable to the world. It clearly is valuable to the world. It's being valued. There are active markets. Um, you know, how will governments regulate it? Lots of governments do regulate it. The U.S. started regulating it in 2013. We worked with the U.S. Treasury Department on those regulations in terms of implementing controls around how people could deal with the risks of money laundering and the like. But, um, so it is, it is being regulated. But Bitcoin's one piece of the puzzle. It is um, an, a very interesting one, and, and, and we certainly could discuss its economic <coughs> philosophy and whether that's something viable over the long right. run. Right, right. Well, Elizabeth, tell us what you're doing, because you're in Senegal and developing BitPesa, um, which is partly on the back of the extremely successful M-Pesa um, product. Tell us about what you're doing. Great. Well, let me tell you a bit about my company because I think that's an example of where the industry has evolved so far and how nascent it still is. So I was one of the first crypto companies or companies using Bitcoin in 2013, the first in the world to make a market between Bitcoin and an African currency, and the first in the world to make a market between <coughs> mobile money and Bitcoin. And how is it that I am the first in the world to do something? It just shows how there was nobody else <laughs> active in this space just five years ago. And now, you know, you mentioned I'm from Senegal. I actually have offices in six countries. We're a, we're a Luxembourg Topco. We're licensed in the UK. We're the first company to get the FCA payments license that accepts Bitcoin. And we have over 25 bank accounts in 15 different subsidiaries. Now, I mention that because that's how complex the regulatory structure has become that a startup of five years, which was conceived in Nairobi, uh, must now have this 
this immense structure to find the bank accounts, to find the regulators to work with. So there's an there's an incredible hurdle creating a company on, on nascent technology within this regulatory space. And I think that's why we still haven't seen that that one great app or that one great company, and why in the U.S. there's really just two or three large companies in one of the biggest markets that are still operating on this. So that's one of the reasons why we still have a lot of, of work to do. But I'd like to just address you know, the comment that maybe just in Venezuela, I mean, we don't want to take a look at the world where it's five countries and then the other nasty bits, because I've been living 11 years on, on the African continent, and it's still impossible in most countries to make a direct transfer within a day from one country to a neighboring country. Even within the East African economic community, to make a transfer between Kenyan shillings and, and Ugandan shillings can take T2 and cost you 7%. Mm. Some of the largest telcos on the continent pay up to 7% to manage their treasury. And when you're looking to make a market between Nigeria and its neighbor, the only pathway is through the US dollar. And if you're trading with China and Japan, again, through the dollar and euro, this suddenly puts a lot of bottlenecks and a lot of needs and use cases for an alternative system. In 11 years, I don't know a single person or entrepreneur in Africa that I've worked with, I won't speak for the whole continent, that has paid for a Microsoft license. <laughs> this is a wildly different environment from maybe where some everybody else is operating. Everybody's using open source software. Every developer coming out of universities, uh, code academies, is using open source software. It's where all the brain power is going. And so for us, when we started out, our goal is to make a market in African currencies, make it easier to send a payment, whether it's $20 or a million dollars, and I'd say our transaction size has grown from 200 average transaction size, $200, to about $100,000. So we moved up and working more with businesses now in, in, in B2B payments. But our goal is really to make it easier to have African currency pairs. So I agree with the professor in that we don't want to replace the local African currencies just yet. There is a need for sovereign currencies. But what is the best method of delivery? What is the technology to do that? Is it a sovereign digital currency? Or is it working with fiat currencies? making a pathway through a digital middle currency, which is what we use Bitcoin for. And, and to date, we've only really used Bitcoin because it's the most liquid going forward. And we use it more as a currency than what Jeremy is using it for in asset management and, and payments. And going forward, we're really looking to see whether digital middle currencies are the solution for illiquidity in emerging markets. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. There's a lot of very interesting issues to tease out there in a moment. But Ning, I'd like to ask you, um, from the perspective of someone who's sitting in China, which of course has been an incredible, in some ways, leader in fintech, um, and yet has a rather mixed regulatory approach towards cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, how do you make sense of what you're hearing right now? Well, I think it's really interesting and dynamic. And first of all, I want to just offer some observation from the ground. Uh, these days, I think the the narrowly defined fintech companies are trying to distance themselves away from cryptocurrency. Mm. And probably the other way is happening as well. So I think in China, you don't group cryptocurrency into the fintech. In China, if you say something about fintech, it's more about peer-to-peer -peer lending, about crowd financing. And I think in that regard, there is a very unique aspect of China in a way that what China is sort of trying to reshape the global financial system or the monetary system. So in that regard, I think there's certain motivation for China to encourage the development of cryptocurrency as an alternative way to the, exi uh, the, the existing uh, monetary system in the world. So I think there is a bit of, uh, it could be just lack of regulation or there could be some uh, encouragement from the regulation trying to propel the development of cryptocurrency in the first place. So, so I think that is quite different in China than from many other countries. But then the, the, I think that has changed quite considerably in the past two years given probably two things. One is, I guess, the concern with what many people tr are trying to use cryptocurrency as a way to circumvent capital flow control. Mm -hmm. This is a very big concern for the regulators. The second is more from the consumer protection. And some of the people who are not knowing better are just pouring their life savings into cryptocurrency and get wiped out. So I think that is the sort of from a regulatory perspective about well, the motivation to propel uh, the development of cryptocurrency in the first place, and I guess the recent shift in uh, perspective in the past two years. Right. But then I want to say two other things. The first is, well, to what extent <coughs> is cryptocurrency a <coughs> currency versus it's an asset? I think that is a big question one would have to answer. I mean, if it's a currency, I think what's the purpose of having an, another currency on top of so many existing ones? I guess the, 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 the popular uh, argument is one, uh, the anonymity that you 
can do certain things which you don't have to be uh, to, to be found out. Two, I think it's the efficiency, as uh, Elizabeth just pointed out. Three, I think, which is very important, I think it, there's a little bit of the identity issue about what's if I use cryptocurrency, I'm in the younger generation, I'm in the future. So I think hope is really a good thing here. And but when it comes to assets, we have to talk about its fundamental value. Mm -hmm. And to that front, I think I've given some similarly unsavorable investment advice to my students. Unlike um, Ken's advice, actually, I advise some of my students to diversify part of their assets into cryptocurrency in the past two years, just a way of diversifying into some risky bets, maybe it will pay off. And of course, unfortunately, they did not in the past year. But then that is a need for an asset, just anything new, I mean, anything as crazy as it can be, can be a valid asset as long as there's demand for diversification and hedging. So I think that is the real need. The, the, the other two need is, I think one is the hedge against the entire existing monetary system. I mean, what if all central governments all of a sudden decide to print more money? Is there somewhere else where I can store my value and retain them? I think that is sort of one motivation. And the last one is, I think I, I feel that more clearly in China, it's about, I think, catching up with Joneses. I think in China, the peer pressure is so much for you to, to make money. And if the, you have missed the housing boom or bubble, then this is the thing. Even though you have no knowledge at, at all about this thing, you want to do some speculation. So again, coming from uh, training in bubbles and the finance, I, mean, I, I do think this, there is fundamental value to cryptocurrency in general, but it is probably not something that can justify, I mean, even its current pricing right. moment. I'm curious, because I'd like to pick up on a potential sort of, if not tension, but difference in perspective between Ken and Jeremy at the beginning, which is that, Professor Rogoff, you suggested that in order to have crypto architecture be put on a more sustainable footing, you needed to have some kind of centralized control institution register. And yet Jeremy said, well, actually, the whole point about the protocols is that they're decentralized. I mean, you know, it's really about protocols at the end of the day rather than blockchain or crypto. And the very nature of protocols is that they're decentralized. How do you resolve that? I mean, Ken or Jeremy? Well, well, I mean, I, if I can start, I, I would say governments can't tolerate large-scale transactions that are anonymous, whether it's uh, real estate. And right now, the regulation has not come. It has not begun. Uh, the U.S. has tiptoed into it. Everyone's just starting to think about it. And I've spoken to the regulators, and they very candidly say, well, there really isn't that much value going on in the transactions. A lot of it's speculation. It's a very interesting innovation. Let's let it roll and see what happens. Yeah. But they're not necessarily planning to let it continue to roll after it does well. They're planning to sort of see where the innovations go. I mean, uh, clearly, I, I, was very, I was very careful to say I was talking about cryptocurrency. Mm. There could be other things, although the crypto element of it, if it's not a contained system that reports to the outside, uh, I, th I, think, uh, I think would be a problem. And this issue about evading capital controls, well, if it's really small, the governments aren't going to do much effort to do it, and you can allow it. But believe me, even in Africa, if it gets big, the reason it's so expensive to push money across countries is the governments don't like it, and they can find ways to stop you from spending it. At the end of the day, it cannot be just an asset. It has to have some, you know, some flow value. If that's never there, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't be worth anything. But I don't attach zero because there could be parts of the world where it is. I can see both Elizabeth and Jeremy are provoked into wanting to speak. Um, <laughs> who wants to jump yeah. in first? Uh, I, I, a, few, a few quick thoughts. Um, you know, I, I think people throw around the word uh, crypto as like a bad thing. It's crypto. It's it's scary. <laughs> Sounds um, a bit like something out of a James Bond, John, James Bond movie. Cryptography is at the foundation of protecting modern society, human privacy. It's a fundamental tool of our cyber defenses. It's a fundamental tool of every corporation. It, and, and in fact, that is radically increasing as we go forward because our systems are so vulnerable and so much of our society relies upon digital infrastructure. Crypto is fundamental in the future. And so kind of crypto computing, which is what these, these blockchain platforms really are, they're open computing platforms. Like we need you know, tamper-proof, resilient, 
uh, decentralized infrastructure if we want society to survive the digital age. So it's like fundamental to where we're headed. And I think the thing that's challenging for people to understand sometimes is that if you want a decentralized system, uh, which is resilient, which was TCPIP was a decentralized system to be resilient from a nuclear weapons attack. That's why it was created. Um, a, if you want a decentralized system for resiliency, that's a public good that everyone can benefit from, you have to incentivize that. And you can't do that by saying, well, you've got to pay for it using a US dollar. And so um, you know, the, there is a fundamental difference in, in our topology between cryptocurrencies, which are specifically designed for being, say, privacy-oriented payment currencies or, or, or have store value characteristics that are, look attractive, but they're fundamentally designed as, a, an, as an asset, versus crypto assets that are commodities. They're more like oil. And these commodity assets are perfectly legal. They're as legal as any other form of data. And Ether is a great example of that. That's a huge market cap commodity asset. The CFTC regulates it. The SEC has given clear guidance that they see it as a commodity. There's no lack of clarity on this. And the US Treasury has said, you know what, if you're moving this stuff around, you got to keep records and you got to work with law enforcement. So there's not a huge piece there. But digital commodities that power these, this new fundamental infrastructure layer of the internet, these are going to grow and grow and grow. And they're going to be bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and so that's just, uh, I think, a, a fundamental uh, piece that I, I'm not sure a, a lot of people understand. Um, the, the, the last, you know, go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah. OK, Elizabeth, you can do a tag team. Yeah. Kind of, you know. And let's also set the scene here. So we don't want to just say it's completely anonymous. If it gets bigger, it'll be crunched. I mean, we have to remember that a, a gigantic majority of, of people operating or owning have purchased or, or work with these digital currencies via regis registration through licensed exchanges. So every <coughs> single customer that we work with has to comply by the KYC AML regulations of the European Union, which means I have um, name, date of birth, address, even in Nigeria, in Ghana, in, in Uganda, I have proof of funds, sor um, source of funds, use of payments, and we can follow it all the way through. So let's put a spectrum on what the use case is for dark web hiring an assassin to <laughs> actually a business using this for you know liquidity, fungibility, um, investment, diversification, uh, a, a, v a VR developer looking to reward its users. There's a million use cases on this spectrum. So will the assassin hiring in the deep dark web, as soon as that gets bigger, will that be clamped down? For sure. But there's a million different other ways we could but, use that. Yeah. And, I, and just, one more, <laughs> just one more point before you jump in is that I think we also need to understand that um, when you're talking about flight of capital, there are pooling mechanisms that you can work with. So if you, if you show as a broker dealer that you're actually circulating funds and there's no net outflow, that's another real use case. And we haven't had broker dealers allowed to operate in a lot of these emerging markets because there was no way for them to manage the transactions without using cash, which was always risky, and do the reporting in line with international standards. Do, a digital version of a broker is able to do that. So mm -hmm. you can, at the same time, prevent the flight of capital, but circulate internally capital enough to free up business flows. And that's what we're working on with a lot of central governments. Right. Sorry, Jeremy, and then... Yeah, I, I had two, two small points. I think one is, um, you know, actually almost six years ago, I testified to the Senate's Homeland Security Committee specifically on the risks of illicit use of, of, of cryptocurrency uh, back in November of 2013. And I sat next to uh, uh, Jen, Chask Jen Chasky, uh, who's the head of FinCEN, so they're in charge of all financial crimes enforcement. And she made it very clear to the committee that uh, they saw a lot of you know, positive uh, uses of digital currency, and they wanted to support a safe, regulated framework. But they made it very yeah. clear. The biggest issue we have with financial crime and with sanctions is with the US dollar. It's a $2 trillion criminal market in US dollars. It is by far the preferred choice of criminals, of uh, sanctioned countries, of everybody. Uh, and in fact, the, the central bank of the US prints, literally, 360 billion physical dollar notes half of which are $100 bills that are sent overseas. I wonder who's demanding those 
those central bank dollars. So the, I think I'm actually supporting Ken's point, which is that crypto is still too small, and that the you know the the big guns are focused on you know the the money that the Fed is is giving out to countries around the world, and that's right. that's where the real problem is. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I think the other piece though is is actually um, a, a, a different one, which is um, I think people uh, they really struggle with. The idea that money is going to work the way that the internet works, <laughs> and, and it's just—it's very hard for people to accept that because we've lived for so long in a in a nation-state-defined system of money. And uh, I, I look at this very similarly to the advent of the of the internet and how information and communications and other things work. You know, governments around the world, including the regulated monopolies that controlled communications, that controlled who could actually broadcast an opinion on the airwaves. Uh, you know, fundamentals uh, of information, states had very tight control over that. Uh, and in, even at the, in the early 90s, there were regulated or, or even national monopolies in many countries. But guess what? The internet got connected. It was not that big of a deal. It was small. It was creeping in. And then it, it grew very dramatically. And I don't think anyone in this room would want to give up the freedom of communications that they have and the ability to access all the information of the world. And I believe the same thing's going to happen with cryptocurrency. I think people are going to see when they have, yeah, I mean, for you example, must be kidding if you don't think Facebook and uh, Twitter are going to get regulated a lot more than. Oh, I, I'm now. not this debating whether there's like going to be regulation. You know, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not debating that there's going to be regulation, but I actually I think society votes. Uh, ultimately, and people who are in power and who run so regulatory agencies. But at the end of the day, the you're basically arguing, okay? I mean, it really comes down to a question of: Are we going to have central control or decentralized like consensus? That's yeah. the core of the issue. Well, I, yeah. I, I, How, I, Ken, I actually Ken think you're going to have you're going to have regulation, yeah. but you're going to have an open network that is radically different than what we have today. Well, I I'd like I see Ken's about to say this time it's different doesn't work, but um, I'd like to ask Ning because <laughs> you're in a country which obviously has a rather <coughs> tangled approach to whether it's a good thing to have decentralization or not. Well, I, th I think a tangled is a very delicate way of putting it, right? <laughs> well, I'm British. I believe in understatement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want to first say something about it. I think, I mean, going back to Jeremy's point, I think, yes, I think the society is always voting. I think this is a dynamic process. I think that's the that's the paradoxical nature of cryptocurrency. If you go really crypto, yes, you're protecting <laughs> a very big interest for a very small group of people, but then and you're not really going very big. But then on the other hand, if you are going to touch upon on a large number of people, then certain type of regulations, disclosures, and protections has to be installed. I think that is the paradox we, we have to face here. The second is going back to, I guess, something maybe Ken would say as well. I think oftentimes, if you look at financial history, Whenever you're trying to use public goods to motivate com commercial enterprises or endeavors, you're probably not going to end up too well. I think I mean, we're experiencing something like that in China as well. But then if you look at back at the internet bubble, I mean, back then we were saying, well, I don't know whether those companies make money, but as long as we have those infrastructure uh, built in, yes, they are going to be uh, very great to human race in the next century. But then all those companies are gone. So I think those are two separate things, whether this is a good concept versus this is a good investment or a good company. That's the second point I'm trying to make. The third one is, I mean, in another session that we were, uh, the three of us were joining uh, yesterday about platform economics. I think there is some demand, which I see in China, for, I think, the distrust in the platform economics. In a way, why would a YouTuber have to uh, pay 30% of his royalties to I don't know, whichever, I mean, iOS or uh, the, the Android system. I think there is, the, among the younger generation, among my students, they are, I mean, going back to the idea of anarchism, they, they're really unhappy with the existing social order, with the existing way how wealth is being distributed. So I think that is probably more fundamental about not specific to uh, Bitcoin or any specific coins, about how the generational shift or the power struggle have to play out in the future. So Elizabeth. just a quick case study. So in, in Kenya, in the last 10 years, we've had a, a boom. And there was Google and Facebook, and everybody came into town and built these tech hubs. And all this activity and social and economic growth was happening. The last few years, there has been a ban on cloud computing for financial institutions, which means all of the new lending and fintech startups, all of the microfinance institutions who are hosting on AWS or in the cloud <coughs> are suddenly required to have a local host 
in Kenyan soil. And this was considered by the powers that be to be safer, the centralized physical place. Now, I'm not going to place judgment. Kenyan government is in attendance. But um, what we will say is, what do you think the consensus would be in five years from now when that happened? Now all the, the youth, the programmers, the, the startups, people that are actually having to pay for these services and they notice one is six times the cost and, and, and not as stable, what, what's going to happen in the, to the professors in five to ten years? Do we think that as people gain power and responsibility and um, they're going to realize that they, they need to have that oversight or do we think there's going to be a fundamental shift in thinking about the security, safety, um, of a centralized system. Mm, interesting. Can I just quickly ask a question? I'm curious about the audience, and I'm going to turn, turn to the audience in a few minutes for questions, but how many of you in the room feel that you really understand how the protocol works, how blockchain and crypto works? Okay. So, Jesse. <laughs> how many of you are still a bit confused about you know, the details or here to learn? Okay. Have you already? Okay, well, you get prizes for honesty. Um, because I do think there's a lot of confusion about this, I this issue. You know, as a journalist, I'm paid to be 10 miles wide and half an inch deep. And I must say, I spend a lot of time trying to get my head around it too. So if I use the wrong language, apologies. How many of you think that Bitcoin price will rally this year? How many of you would go and buy it? And how many of you wouldn't touch it with the barge pole? Okay. And just lastly, how many of you are optimistic about the future of the crypto architecture, that you assume that overall it's going to keep expanding and deepening? And how many of you think that it's actually completely overhyped and actually quite dangerous? Okay, one. Okay, you definitely get prizes for bravery. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I just want to get a sense of where the room is. It's fascinating. But um, given that there is a sort of paradox between having institutional buy-in and central control and the decentralized nature of the protocol, what do you all think about the idea of central banks getting involved? Should central banks be issuing their own cryptocurrencies? Because okay. that seems to be such a paradox. I had Professor a couple Rogoff. comments along these lines. I mean, first, we want to distinguish between uh, alternatives to credit cards, to Western Union, uh, where there's a lot of room for innovation, having lower costs, more competition. Uh, there are some countries who've done it other ways. India has much lower costs on its credit cards than anybody else does. Uh, but, but there's another element, I mean, particularly through Jeremy's remarks, but to some extent, Elizabeth, a certain libertarian street to this. And I'm not against that. I don't think governments do everything that are wonderful. But, you know, in the extreme, there's the issue of how do you pay for protection and police and your army and other public services that people want more and more and more. Uh, and, you know, how, how do you uh, find out transactions and tax them? And governments have a big interest in doing this. I, I, I agree with Jeremy strongly that the U.S. dollar is a big problem. I've written a book about that in a way. Um, and and there's there's sort of a question of of of, of how to of how to balance these things, um, but I I I want to I want to say that when it comes to the currency, there are other issues like dealing with financial crises, recessions, cryptocurrencies are not bulletproof. They are not something that cannot be overrun by you know, a state that wanted to cause damage. There are papers on this, and especially if they get big and the incentives are big. It's not just about making money. Bitcoin, for example, is somewhat resistant, but not perfectly resistant to that. But if someone just wants to make mischief and they're willing to spend $100 billion to bring down the international financial system, there seem to be ways to do that. So it's, and then you don't, who, who do you call? Oh, we decentralized it. What do we do? Mm. So I, I think there's certain high scale uh, responsibilities that the state is just not going to relinquish. And after a disaster, the public won't want it either. So Elizabeth and Jeremy, I mean, do you think it's a good idea to have central banks doing this? Or even just financial institutions, because of course the financial institutions are all dashing in now as well. Well, I'm, I'll start with Elizabeth and Jeremy. I would say that on a libertarian spectrum, I'm away from the, the, the heavy libertarian end, and I get killed on Twitter from the crypto community about this quite often. So well, I'm glad you're not the only one. Can't be tweeted. I would, um, but I, but for me, I mean, I'm I'm for the promotion of African currencies. I'm for the promotion of African governments regaining control of their ability to manage their own monetary systems. I currently reside in Senegal, where we still have 
most of the, the, the West African franc reserves in France, in French banks by law. So I mean, I'm, I'm, I definitely agree with you there. But there has to be a way to live in harmony, where we don't just say it's completely decentralized or we, we leave it in the control. There has to be room for innovation on that. And that's where we're struggling. That's where, we're, where the two sides of the spectrum are at opposite ends. So you know, Christine Lagarde has spoken openly about um, digital currencies for banks. And I think that's, that's essential. In some ways, the mobile money movement took a lot of the pressure from some governments to think about this. But in our platform discussion yesterday, we talked a lot about what happens when you give too much control to the platform. So in this entrance, it was like a quasi-digital currency. It is pegged to the Kenyan shilling, um, M-Pesa, run by Safaricom, which 90% of the economy flows through. It's somewhat overseen. It's pegged, but it's controlled by a privately owned corporation. So at what, you know, at what instance is that scary? And do we believe that after everything that Facebook has been through, people complain for a day or two, but then they're back to using it? Mm. So is there going to be a, a complaint looking for that one Mr. Bitcoin, that one person in charge, that one father figure to take control? Or are we going to evolve into a, co a community, a global community, where we're not looking for that responsibility and we, we understand that there's self-responsibility? Right. Yeah, um, you know, on, on two of the points being discussed, I think, um, you know, in, in general, we, we do, in, with the Internet itself, uh, we live in a world where any major state actor could wreak havoc on the global financial system by attacking known systems. That's not unique to cryptocurrency. Like, that it's very well documented and understood that, you know, the U.S., or, uh, or China or Russia or other nations could wreak havoc on the global financial system if they chose to do so. The cyber weapons are incredibly sophisticated. That's, it's mutually assured destruction is the issue. No one wants to bring down the global economic system. And so if it, become, if it has systemic risk over time, you, you will face that mutually assured destruction. So I, I don't know that that's a, entirely true. But on the central bank uh, issue, we're huge proponents of central bank digital currency. And, and we've believed in that for a very long time. Our view is that um, the, the creation of cryptocurrencies that are based on central bank money is happening in the private sector first. Mm. Um, we've launched that. We launched US dollar coin last fall. It's growing rapidly. It's been growing at 10 to 20% per week in terms of issued uh, US dollars. Wow. These are cryptocurrencies that can run over a public blockchain that work uh, interoperably with, uh, you know, tens of millions of digital wallets around the world. Uh, it can be used in lending transactions, in payments transactions. You can, it allows you to make dollar payments globally at pennies uh, and in you know, seconds to minutes. So it's, it's a really powerful innovation. We don't, think I, I, the Federal I, Reserve, we don't think the Federal Reserve is a technology company. They may ultimately say, hey, if, if banks are doing this, here are the rules for how you ought to do it, but private sector is going to do this first. So I, I just want to say something very clearly, though, which is a lot of the issues surrounding these uh, safe, coin, safe coins, stable coins, particularly from 2017 and 2018, they really sound like fixed exchange rates to me with a lot of the issues that fixed exchange rates have. And as they grow, I promise you they will feel some of the same attacks as fixed exchange rates. There may be a, a range of them. There's been also a lot of papers about those. Yeah, it's a derivative. I'm happy to talk more about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say two things really quickly. I wish we had, it's almost like a tennis match. I wish I had you two on one side, two on the other, and we could just do <laughs> be like a ping pong ball in the middle. So one is, uh, in central banks, we take them for granted, but then they don't always exist. The reason why we have central banks, there is a historical reason for that. So I think that is, I mean, they provide public goods as well, which are not being appreciated as much as we should probably do right now. This is the first point. The second point is, I mean, based on my observation in China, well, that, that role of bank of last resort or the guarantee of last resort is really, really valuable. In China, we have recently a very big crackdown on the peer-to-peer -peer lending. The reason is, in the past, whenever the investors lost their money, they know where to go to. They know there's a bank, there's a branch, there's a regulator. But now <laughs> they do peer-to-peer, they don't even know where to go. And then the government are scared because, what well, if my investors are losing $10 billion and they don't know where to go, they will come to me. And how would I solve that problem? So I think that's the counterpart of the, the other side of the same coin. That's fascinating. Well, I'm going to turn to the audience for questions now or comments because I do sense that we have a lot of people in the room who are pretty knowledgeable about this area, if not pretty passionate. 
Um, I would ask you, please, to keep your comments and or questions courteous, um, but also <laughs> short, wow, okay. because there's a lot of... I've, I've done Bitcoin That's crypto amazing. things before, and sometimes it's got a bit out of hand. Um, I say passions can run very high, uh, which is great. You don't normally get that in a lot of financial journalism, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> no one argues that way about M3. Um, but, um, it would also be courteous, but not compulsory, to identify yourself. So, who would like to make any comments or questions? I think we have a microphone roving around. <coughs> Hi, my name is Youngmin. I'm Global Shaper from Korea. Uh, I'm a millennial. I'm also owning cryptocurrency. So, uh, I, I'm not that passionate, but I have some passion about Bitcoin specifically. Uh, to me, I guess um, the political meaning of Bitcoin <coughs> is bigger than economic sense. Uh, the essence of Bitcoin is anarchistic libertarianism, I guess. Mm. And uh, it is liberating money from bank and nation. It is giving sovereignty to individual from nation, I guess. So I think it is the true essence of Bitcoin. And given this nature, do you think it is a good idea to make peace with the legacy financial institution system? So, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> Do you want to achieve scale and success the hard way or the easier way? Do you want to achieve it the slow way or the fast way? So I think the companies in the space have made a choice. Those who realize that they want to progress and move fast and grow have partnered in a lot of ways. The ones that have gone completely without registration and licensing have struggled in some ways. There's very few success um, outside of maybe Binance. Um, who have, have grown to that huge scale without going for those licensing in a lot of ways. And, you know, they're getting licensed right now in, in Europe. So I think practicality comes in. And, I, and to really, if you're going to be operating with users, you, how are they going to pay you? Well, they have to pay for this libertarian asset using their credit card or their bank transfer. So I think that pegging to reality is the problem. Unless everybody's going to meet in a park and exchange cash, we have to peg back to the, the real world, the, the older world. That's, I, you know, I, I think the, 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 the philosophy is a really important one that we shouldn't take lightly. Um, you know, we live in a world where, for all we know, in five years, many of us could be living under harsh authoritarian regimes. We, we don't know if that's the case. We can't assume that the arc of liberal democracies will continue the same way it is. We know there are many states that are you know, quite oppressive. Um, you know, so, so that's, that's one, one piece to be concerned about. I, I think in general, though, this is similar to the kind of, um, you know, it, it, the backdoor conversation that is, goes on with companies like Apple uh, and Microsoft and Facebook, which is can governments have a backdoor into the communications platforms that these companies run? And there is a, uh, a very, very strong uh, conviction that people are entitled to their privacy and that there are other means for law enforcement to do their job. And there are others that would like to give the encryption keys, and a key here is we're talking about crypto in all these cases, give the encryption keys to a benevolent state actor who is going to do the right thing all the time. And what's very clear in history is that governments do not do the right thing all the time. They can sometimes become incredibly oppressive, uh, you know, we don't know what that arc is. And so I think in, in a digital age where we're 100% digital and we're connected globally, uh, sovereign money, self-sovereign money is critical to human freedom. Right. And uh, that, that will be valued very highly, not just from places like Venezuela and Argentina, and certainly I, it's valued I, I, very highly. I, I, I mean, there's a certain cult like. It's great. Every time Jeremy it. speaks, <laughs> Ken starts getting <laughs> agitated. <laughs> and then Ning gets agitated too. It's wonderful. <laughs> I, say, I just wish I had you on the I agree me. with what Elizabeth said that at the end of the day, this has to be grounded and you have to be able to use it. And unfortunately, if we live in an authoritarian world, they have a lot of tools to do that that prevent you from using it at retail stores, prevent you from using it at banks. If they couldn't do that, well, then this could evolve, and they couldn't collect taxes, they couldn't enforce laws. Um, there is a big debate about the back door. I think to the extent there is a back door, then 
they can let it go because then they can audit anything or monitor anything. But I mean, this, this isn't, I'm, I'm not trying to make, you know, philosophical thing about we shouldn't have libertarianism, government should be allowed to be, you know, uh, p powerful and stuff. I th I th I'm afraid they are. And they're not going to allow this to foster in that way. They never have in history. And that doesn't mean there aren't a lot of uses and it won't become very valuable in other ways. Again, think of the businesses that credit cards have, that Western Union has, many other things. I think the security thing's a big issue of how, how to provide that. My, my last book's about the past, present, and future of money. I write about central bank digital currencies. Uh, I, but I think it's very unsettled. Central banks are thinking about this, about whether what the form of the architecture will be. Are there any central bankers here who'd like to jump in representing authoritarian monetary <laughs> policy? <laughs> Anyone, any offers? <laughs> they're either here and very shy or they're not here. Okay, we have some more questions, I think, um, over there. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mona Elisa. I'm um, from the blockchain world, but I wouldn't say that I'm an anarchist or anything like that. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to make a comment uh, listening to this panel. Um, it seems very polarized. It seems, uh, and, and also um, my colleague's uh, uh, comment earlier, the debate always seems to end up in a very polarized discussion between governments are never going to allow you to do this and decentralized protocols are, you know, it, it's, I, it's not, it basically ends up in either or, is it going to be this or that? And I personally believe that the two systems can actually be in parallel and it can be a, a user choice. And I think actually that's the most sensible way forward. Because if you think about what the two systems offer you just as a, as a user or as, an, as, a, as, a, as just a, a participant in, in, in the economy. One, uh, one system, keeping your money in a bank and transacting in the traditional asset management industry, um, makes you dependent on financial intermediaries and makes you basically dependent on bailouts like 2008 right. and governments and central bank decisions. So that's a personal choice that we've actually, it's, it, until now, we have only had that choice, right? Now we have an alternative system developing where you have a lot of decentralized applications, uh, which Elizabeth and Jeremy discussed and which we're building, which give you an alternative way or uh, diver to diversify your risk, right? You can hold assets uh, where you have right. full ownership of your assets or you can transact in financial systems in a completely decentralized way where at all times you are the full custodian or the full owner of your assets. But it comes with a huge degree of self-responsibility. Right. And you have to understand. So the barrier there is user experience and, um, uh, and, um, and, okay. and education. So it's just, it's just to say that I think that there's two types of risk and that the decentralized um, protocols, you have to trust in the code and in right. the governance system okay. around those. And maybe it shouldn't be such a polarized discussion, but they're actually closer than we think. And Mona and okay. I are on a WhatsApp group, female pragmatists of Bitcoin. <laughs> Fantastic. So female pragmatists, it's all like a financial supermarket. You can choose whether you want to put your faith in institutions or diversify. Or, or diversify. Just, just That's actually probably the, the most sensible oh, way to go for it. Let's take another question. Yeah, I was just going to, just to be clear, the, the middle road is the right one, meaning like working closely with governments, collaborating on the rules, making sure the regs are clear, making sure that there are registered actors that deal with this. But the underlying, these underlying assets have to be unencumbered and, and bare instruments. So uh, being decentralized but dancing with centralization. Sounds like having your cake and totally. eating in some ways. But um, <laughs> quickly there and then there and then I know Ning. And in fact, let's go one, two, three, and then Ning. I'm... My name is Eugene Chung. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Penrose Studios. We do virtual and augmented reality. Um, a question that I have for the panel, and I'm very curious given the, the dynamic, is uh, we don't have enough data on cryptocurrencies to understand what the long-term correlations uh, to the market are uh, or the financial beta. And what's interesting is that you have a lot of little, you know, sort of idiosyncratic moments. So in 2013, when Bitcoin was a, you know, now pastoral sort of $40 per coin, uh, there was the Cyprus event that, of course, caused uh, sort of a spike in the price. Uh, but now today in the market, <laughs> there seems to be a high degree of correlation to specifically big technology stocks. Um, so do we have a sense of what the long-term nature of this and perhaps a, a sort of a, a great collapse will be necessary to really test whether it is, in fact, 
more like gold or more like technology stocks, but I'm curious if there's an so we actually Great, great yeah. question. Do um, okay. you want to answer it very quickly? Yeah. I want to get two more questions. We, we run a daily report on the correlations of the core crypto assets to the major indices and other kind of things. And there's very, very limited correlation, but you have, you have periods of correlation. You know, it has become a, an invested asset as a high risk beta asset similar to equities in technology, right? So that correlation began really because of the bubble. The bubble cre brought in all these retail yeah. investors, the retail investors, this correlated to the kind of investments they'd make in, in, in higher risk equities. So that, that's sort of natural. Longer term, obviously, we have no idea. Just want to add one thing. I think the, the, the lack of correlation is probably because, well, the, the short term time period and also the excessive volatility in cryptocurrency prices, because compared to that volatility, nothing else is Anything. And that's related to liquidity in many aspects. Liquidity and volatility are sort of intercorrelated. Well, if the world carries on being volatile in the mainstream assets, that may look a bit different this year. But um, Jennifer, and then a question, then a comment there. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer. I'm, I'm with a company called ScanTrust. So we're not a blockchain company, but we in, in integrated techn uh, blockchain technology on our um, software platform to bring product transparency and trusted traceability. Um, I, I really enjoy the debate uh, here. I feel like what's happened in, in the last year in the crypto world is very similar to my mother, you know, buying a Reba and Commerce One stock back in 1999. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the internet stayed and we had Google and we had Amazon and, um, and we had Baidu. Um, so in the long, uh, in the medium to the long term, I believe that the cryptocurrency is right. here to stay and obviously blockchain is real. Um, but the, I, I guess the question I had is how, like, what does a panel think are the major barriers that stand in the way of mass adoption of cryptocurrency? Okay. Before we answer, I'd just like to take, because we've only got a few more minutes. Um, I think we had a hand at the back from the one person who was brave enough to say that he didn't think this was going to last. So I think right, we should have um, a comment from you and then... Uh, Gottfried Leibrand, I'm the CEO of Swift. We, we manage... <laughs> Sorry, of course. Um, and it, it's a, I, let me start with an observation. I've been through Swift. this, I think, for seven years now. I got interested in blockchain and Bitcoin, I think, in 2012 already. We've gone, we're definitely in a different world from last year, partly because we have empty seats in a crypto session. <laughs> yeah. All the male panelists are wearing ties. So we, we are, you know... <laughs> well, only one of them works in the industry, yes. But, um, but I, I would... I am, I'm not a central banker, but I'm overseen by <coughs> central banks. And I would like to maybe say something on behalf of central bankers. When it, when it comes to money, I think over the past couple of thousand years, we have learned that when things go bad with money, they go bad in a big way. Um, and the reason we have all the regulation of banks, we have central banks, lenders of last resource, are really to manage three big risks. One is if, if banks go up, you have bank runs, you have all sorts of dynamics that are, that are systemic, which are not good for society. We learned that lesson the hard way. The second is money is a great way to swindle consumers. People tend to not understand how they work. So part of the reason banks are regulated is to prevent consumers from being uh, screwed. And the third way is we found that money is a pretty good way to prevent bad guys from doing things. That's why we have anti-money laundering controls, anti-bribery, et cetera. So there is a reason we have all these things. And I'd like to, I mean, before we go libertarian, it is good to keep those in mind. And I think that's, that's the point that- uh, Right, and, okay, and well, thank you. Well, we that's, have... why, that's was why I'll be the outlier here and say this stuff can be dangerous. Well, we have literally about two or three minutes. Um, so, Jeremy and Elizabeth, I'd like to just have you just say literally one minute, I'm going to be ruthless, explaining, well, you can, if you want, you can answer that point, or you can simply say, what are the crucial things that have to happen next to actually make it work? Well, it's uh, no small point that most of the former CEO and group of SWIFT has joined the Gates Foundation to repent for their ways of, you know, <laughs> de-risking and excluding half the global population from the financial system. Just a, a small comment on that. I mean, yes, those risks are real, but is that the only solution? Is that really the only way? We have to find another way. And, and you know, again, not going all the way over. And what are, the, what are the main barriers? Well, one of the main barriers was that the first time everybody heard about this was the deep dark web, scary, scary crypto. And that's that's a, a trust issue that's taken a long time to shake off. <clears throat> Secondly, anything in the financial industry is a tough business for a startup. It's a, it's a regulated industry, and we're going up against incredible giants. So I think we have to understand that we're in a tough industry, plus we came with a really bad reputation. So a lot of the companies struggle to raise funds, struggle to gain partners, and we're seeing it difficult to kind of grow at a scale. And that's changing us. It's a bear market. It's the time to build. 
Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, I mean, the, the, the long game is how do we use things like public blockchains and smart contracts to reconstruct the basic primitives of, of financial services. So storing dollars, uh, transmitting money and facilitating payments, facilitating loans uh, between people and individuals and businesses, and issue, you know, issuing uh, equities and bond-like uh, instruments. So all of those things are technically becoming possible on top of uh, these platforms. And, uh, and so from my perspective, that's what I'm interested in, because our interest is how do we reinvent the fundamental primitives of the global economic system uh, using fiat currency, just to be clear, I'm not talking about using Bitcoin to do that. I'm talking about using fiat currency on top of these new public blockchains to build a more open, global, inclusive, and efficient uh, economic system that feels and behaves much more like the Internet. What needs to happen is mostly in the realm of computer science. What we're focused on is making sure we understand what are the computer science problems that are being solved to deal with security, scale, uh, uh, and, and other features that are needed for this to happen. So where we spend most of our time is in the technical communities and developer communities that are actually pushing this forward. We also spend a lot of time with regulators because there's continuing need for clarity and we're at the forefront of, of regulatory work everywhere that we operate. And so there's a lot of time there, but the real issue is we need to continue to build out the technology. And that was the right. same issue in 2000 when the internet bubble burst. So the infrastructure wasn't ready for what we have today. Right. Ning, well, Ken, do you want to say very quickly, or about 30 seconds each? Okay. Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll first say, I mean, I do think there are many things happening, but as far as these being bearer instruments, being things that are anonymous, if you see value, I would view them as a lottery ticket on dystopia. Mm -hmm. That uh, <laughs> as long as, as, long as uh, governments reign, uh, we're not going to see this. I, I think a point I forgot to mention, but uh, thankfully was mentioned, is stuff happens. For example, oh, you have World War I. How are you going to finance it? How are you going to raise taxes in an emergency? How do you do anything? And if you don't have access to the unit of account, to the currency, you can't do it. So yes, a society may be built on right. these decentralized currencies, but it will disappear uh, uh, in due time. Right. Ning. I think what's standing between now and the, the full blown of uh, cryptocurrency or blockchain is human nature, the greed and fear. The, the, the thing that when people are doing a lot of things they don't really understand, but they go ahead with that anyway. And we have seen that with many of the so-called financial innovations in the history. And I think they typically will leave a lot of the investor lose a lot of money. So going back to, I think, what Mona pointed out about, well, I think the middle way is the right way. But then I think if you look at I will just give you one example of investing in stock market, right? I mean, 90% of the market used to be dominated by retail investors in the US, now less than 20%. That's the natural revolution. So in some sense, one sentence, I recommend all people who are very, very interested in uh, cryptocurrency to read a Hayek's book about the road to serfdom. <laughs> well, that's a great comment. Well, listen, <laughs> we've had a lot of fantastic comments today, very interesting, <laughs> passionate debate. I mean, I take away three key points. One is that, Davos is always a wonderful contraindicator. The fact that you had last year the promenade covered with crypto signs was a very sure prediction that Bitcoin was heading for a crash. <laughs> but on that basis, the fact that we have empty seats today suggests that maybe the market having crashed is beginning to regroup. Maybe we are beginning to enter a phase of more maturity. However, the fundamental tension between distributed trust between having a protocol which is decentralized, if not anarchic, and having a more centralized system of institutional trust, that one is still there. Yes, people are looking for a third way. I hope you can find it. I lived through the UK where a third way was once season politics, and that didn't <laughs> well. But in all genuine, in all seriousness, as the market matures, I do wish you two the best of luck in convincing the cynics that it will work and making sure that we don't have another crash. So thank you all. <laughs>